Today on Cook's Country, Natalie makes Bridget the best cast iron baked chicken. Jack challenges Julia to a tasting of hot sauce. And Ashley makes Julia a perfect blueberry cornbread. That's all right here on Cook's Country. Cast iron cookware has been a part of the American story from day one. Paul Revere refined the classic Dutch oven so that the lid had a flange for holding hot coals. And he added legs so that the pot could stand upright over a campfire. Now, George Washington's grandmother, Mary Hughes, willed her cast iron cookware, which she called furniture, to her <laughs> daughter, Mary Ball. Lewis and Clark carried the heavy pots throughout their two-year exploration of the Louisiana Purchase in 1804. And they even brought along a few extra as gifts for any Native American they met along the way. Now, at the start of the 19th century, there were hundreds of U.S. cast iron cookware producers, but by the end of the 20th century, only about a dozen stood. But cast iron is back. New U.S. manufacturers have hit the market, and since 2013, cast iron cookware sales are up 37%. That is good news. Today, we're using cast iron and taking a new look at baked chicken. So let's head into the kitchen with Natalie to see how it's done. Baked chicken is a familiar dish. It should be simple, easy, but it can be problematic. And here's the problem. You take a chicken, you put it in a baking dish. If you want the meat to be juicy and tender inside, the skin is kind of pale and flabby. But if you get that skin super crisp, the meat inside is often overcooked. Until today, we have a baked chicken expert with us, Natalie, and she's gonna solve all of these problems. Well, the simple things are the hardest, right? Right. And we realized during our testing that a glass baking dish wasn't really doing anything for right, us. Right. So we wanted to use a cast iron. We're baking in cast iron. Correct. Once it gets heated up all the way, it tends to retain heat mm -hmm. way longer than an aluminum pan or a glass ceramic dish. So what we want to do is we want to heat it up in the oven as opposed to the stove top. Right, because the stove top is kind of spotty the way that it heats up cast iron. So we're going to start in a cold oven okay. at 450 degrees. Cold pan, cold, cold oven. Cold pan, cold oven. And once it comes up to 450 degrees, it's good to go. Okay. So we obviously need to season our chicken, and we wanted to keep classic baked chicken flavors, and we also wanted to give it some color. So this is two teaspoons of salt, and to this we're gonna add two teaspoons of paprika, and one teaspoon of pepper, half a teaspoon of onion powder, and half a teaspoon of granulated garlic. That's it, that's the spice mixture, that's, that's easy. Exactly, pantry items. Just gonna mix this until it's incorporated. All right, so we're just gonna set this aside for now and we're gonna get down to the chicken. We like to use a uh, whole chicken here because it's more economical. You get to control more of the parts as far as like what size you want, how much fat you wanna trim off of it. So we're gonna start by patting it dry. And how big is the chicken? This is a four pound bird and it's gonna yield three pounds in parts. And then I'm gonna start by taking off the skin that connects the breast to the thigh, just using the tip of the boning knife, not using the whole blade. Yeah, I always say that the chicken will tell you where to make the cuts. There always seems to be a little fat seam uh -huh. at just about every place you cut. And then we're just gonna flip it over and kind of pop this joint out. Let gravity do the work for us. Go along, take this off. Use this little line of demarcation over here to take it away from the joint and separate the leg from the thigh. We're gonna take off any excess fat so it doesn't render into our sauce. And then we're gonna take this wing tip and use the same method, kind of let gravity do the work and take it off from the breast. And we're going to discard the wing tips. And we're gonna do the same on the other side. I'm gonna take off the back with a larger knife. Okay. I'm gonna take the chef's knife and I'm gonna go down as close to the spine as I can. I'm gonna do the same with the other side as well. And then with this, I'm just gonna go along the breastbone. And then once I get towards this breastbone, I'm just gonna press down. Just crush that bone. So now that we've broken down our chicken, we're going to season it. So this is our spice mixture. 
Season pretty liberally from up high. Get better coverage if you do it up high rather than the right on there. That's right. So you have to make sure to season liberally on both sides. We really want all these flavors to penetrate into the chicken. All right. We're using all of the rub. Yes, we're all using the all the rub. Great. All right, so we've got our chicken season, and now we're just going to wait for our pan to come up to temperature. Okay. So we've taken our cast iron out of the oven, and it's really hot, as you it's can feel. It's super hot. Screaming hot. And we're just going to start off with two tablespoons of unsalted butter. I love the little handle cover you've got there. It's I like know, a, it's perfect. little baseball mitt. It's a good idea if you don't have a handle cover for your hot cast iron skillet, you can wrap it with a towel just to remind yourself that it's hot. To this, we're going to add six thyme sprigs just for some aromatics. Mm, nice. We're going to start off with our chicken. We're going to start skin side first because we want that immediate browning. All right. This is like Rubik's chicken. You've got to figure out how to jigsaw it all in there. Yeah, kind of like Tetris. <laughs> so you can move around the thyme sprigs if they tend to be in the way. Okay. So all going skin side down. Yes, skin side down. Yeah, I think you're going to make it. It's great. We're just gonna pop this in the oven for 15 minutes. And it's still at 450? Yes, at 450. Oh, right. ho, ho, ho. thank you. It smells so good in here. It smells awesome, doesn't it? gonna flip these over and you can already <gasps> see that it has such nice color on it. Gorgeous browning. Yeah, you don't get that in a glass baking dish. Oh, definitely not. Between the spices and the herbs that are in there, the whole kitchen smells phenomenal. It does. So we're gonna let this go for another 15 minutes or until the breast reads 160 and the legs and the thighs read 175. All right, so roughly 15 minutes aside. Correct. Great, I'll get the door. Thank you. Oh, that looks beautiful. I know. I'm excited for this. We're just gonna temp one of the thighs. And we're looking for? 175. Oh, it's perfect. So we're just gonna let this rest in the skillet for about 10 minutes because we want the juices to get reabsorbed back into the chicken. Okay. All right, so our chicken has been resting for 10 minutes. Now it's time to plate it up. Thank goodness. So. Start off by taking out some of the pieces and then we can discard the thyme sprigs that are in here because they've done their work. Oh. So we have some pretty delicious pan drippings over here and we're just gonna whisk this up a little bit. That's the gold in the bottom of the pan. <laughs> exactly. We're just gonna spoon them over our chicken. Oh yeah. Looks awesome. Well, I like that you didn't have to make a sauce separately. Keeping with the whole simple is better theme here. Exactly. So would you like a breast? Yes. For you? Lovely. You have to see if this is actually really juicy too. The key was getting color on the outside of the chicken, but juicy meat inside. Exactly. You can hear it too. Like crispy, crispy skin. skin. Oh. Tender, juicy. I mean, look at that. Mmm, it is so good. That spice mixture. It goes a long way. Oh. It goes a very long way. It actually tastes like long roasted chicken. It does, oh. without the roux, without mm -hmm. the minced mm -hmm. garlic, without the onions, mm -hmm. it's 30 minutes. The upfront work, the prep, it was just breaking down a chicken, which really, it's a great thing to learn at home because it is gonna save you a lot of money and all these pieces are cooked perfectly. But also, you can do all that prep while the cast iron is heating in the oven. Exactly. I know it cooks like a weeknight meal, but it doesn't taste like a weeknight meal. It doesn't uh -uh. taste Not at like all. you took any shortcuts. The skin on that chicken is so well rendered. It's perfectly juicy, too. Thanks, Natalie. Well, you're welcome. Solved all of our baked chicken problems. I'm glad you liked it. Well, our baked chicken starts with heating a cast iron skillet in the oven. Meanwhile, make an easy spice mixture with paprika, onion powder, and granulated garlic. Break down a whole chicken into parts and season with the spices. Add butter and thyme sprigs to the skillet. 
add the chicken skin side down and bake until done, flipping the chicken over halfway through cooking. Let the chicken rest in the skillet and then serve with those pan juices. So from Cook's Country, a foolproof and really better way to chicken, it's cast iron baked chicken. Hot sauce is big business, raking in over $538 million a year. So Jack's here today to explain the difference between the variety of brands. Yeah, and I brought a little gift. <laughs> a milk. Whole milk. Whole so, milk. you know, the extra fat and the milk sugars are going to help you more than water. Oh, thank you. Now, I should say, the lovely <laughs> studio audience has picked the winner. Oh, of course they did, a smart bunch. And yeah, and in case you were wondering, I didn't make them do this. You didn't? No, they had it over cheesy, creamy grits. <laughs> oh, you guys didn't eat it straight? <laughs> well, uh. I, I just met them, so. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna put me through it. Yeah. I actually love hot sauce. Well, we'll see so at the I'm end of the tasting what you say. All right, so I'm just gonna dig in? Yeah, just dig in. All right. Um, these are traditional hot sauces, so these are not sriracha, which is, you know, sort of the trend. <laughs> Yep, it's hot sauce. <laughs> yeah, I like how you just went right <gasps> there. Yeah. You know, not like a little teeny bit. Like, Ooh. let's just go right into it. Second one. So, sriracha is got sugar in it and usually a lot more garlic. Mm -hmm. So these are cayenne peppers. Mm -hmm. There's vinegar. Um, some of them are aged, so it's like they mash with salt in barrels and they get more complexity. I in like this one. Our winner. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 I could drink that. That's good. Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. The heat level, as you know, is measured on Scoville units. Mm -hmm. And the samples here range from 450, which is very mild. I mean, zero would be a bell pepper. Mm -hmm. uh, a million would be like, you know, a ghost chili. So the sauces we tasted ranged on the Scoville scale from 450 up to 3000. For comparison, a raw jalapeno on the Scoville scale is about 2500. So it's about the same level of heat as the spiciest of these sauces. Okay. Interestingly, you can tell a lot by reading the ingredient list mm. and whether it begins with peppers, vinegar, or water. And that will tell you a lot about what kind of sauce you're getting. <laughs> the number one ingredient in the list tells you what it tastes like. Right. You're either going to get a mild sauce, a hot sauce, or a vinegary sauce. Mm -hmm. So, anything oh. that you're noticing here? Yeah. <laughs> I hope I brought enough milk. Oh, this milk is good. <laughs> okay. Yep. I'm good. Would you like to start with what you liked? Yeah. So, I loved this one, as I mentioned. I could drink this one. I know this brand. I know this flavor. I put this on my wings. This is the very traditional essence of a buffalo chicken wing in my book. So this is my favorite. Um, I like how it has a little bit of a garlicky flavor to it. And I love how like you have no confidence whatsoever. <laughs> you're like, so you're hedging your bet. So let's yep. see how the, your bet paid off. Yep. You are 100% yep. correct. That's the Frank's Red Hot. Mm -hmm. We actually did a Buffalo Wings tasting. And we loved it there because it's got a really nice consistency yep. and it clings well. It's also got a lot more salt than the rest of these. Oh, interesting. Um, so it brings, you know, if, if hot sauce is a flavor enhancer, mm -hmm. all that salt helps. Studio audience, landslide, that was their favorite. Ah, good choice. So, what's your second favorite? This one. Um, I didn't recognize it, but I really liked it. It had a lot of other flavors going on. Um, it's spicy, but it had a little bit of a Worcestershire, umami, anchovy thing going on that I liked. All right, so this is ah. Tabasco. This is, I would say, the most vinegar forward. Vinegar is the first ingredient. It's also, I actually think it's the hottest. And when we did the lab test with the Scoville units, it was the hottest at the 3000. Okay. This one yeah. did not like it. Um, and I'm surprised to hear you say this has more vinegar than this. This, this to me was watery, vinegary, sharp, acidic, cheap, awful, um, lighter fluid. That's again, what I would say about again, that one. No opinions whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, you know, it just makes my job so hard. Well, this has the most water. This is oh, uh, interesting. Uh, Cholula. This one I say incredible. is really fruit forward, but not necessarily in a good way. No. Um, wow, I own this. I buy this regularly, but I had no idea that I like this one so much more. Well, now you know. Now I know. So if you want to buy the winning hot sauce at the supermarket, go with Frank's Red Hot Original Cayenne Pepper Sauce at $3.49 for a 12-ounce jar. When we set out to make a new recipe here at Cook's Country, we start by finding as many versions of that recipe as we can find, and we make a few in a side-by-side -side test. Now, when we did this with blueberry cornbread, 
The differences were dramatic. Some were cakey, some were savory, some had an odd bluish color, didn't they, Ashley? They absolutely did, almost gray even. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't very appetizing. Mm -mm. And honestly, it was just very simple what we wanted to do. We wanted to find a way to add blueberries to cornbread. The idea is simple, <laughs> but as it turns out, it's not as simple to make. So the first idea, savory or sweet? Well, we kind of teeter-tottered in the middle there. <laughs> okay. We did find a really nice balance of the two, so I'll walk you through how we did it. All right. All right, so first we are going to start with a nine inch greased light colored cake pan, and I'm gonna line it with one and a half tablespoons of yellow cornmeal. Okay. So instead of dusting the cake pan with flour as you would with cakes, notice I said cakes, and I asked you about sweet versus savory. <laughs> so we're already kind of treating it like a cake. But instead of dusting the pan with flour, you're dusting it with cornmeal. Yes. That makes sense. Yeah, and it's just going to help for um, easy release, and it's going to give you a little bit of that cornmeal crunch. I'm all about texture, so it's <laughs> going to be a good one. And I did notice she said light colored cake pan. What happens if you use a dark colored pan? You have to shorten the cook time. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, now on to the dry ingredients. Here we have one and a half cups of all purpose flour one cup of yellow cornmeal, and this is just the regular yellow cornmeal that you find in most grocery stores. Here we have three quarters of a cup of granulated sugar, two teaspoons of baking powder, and finally three quarters of a teaspoon of table salt. Just gonna whisk that until combined. Now you said one and a half cups of flour to one cup of cornmeal. Now obviously we must have tried different ratios, but that's more flour than cornmeal. Sounding oh, yeah. a little cakey. Well, <laughs> again, teeter-tottering. We're walking that fine line, trying to keep you in suspense. <laughs> and I think it's working. All right, so we'll move on down to our wet ingredients. Here we have 12 tablespoons of unsalted butter that I've gone ahead and melted and then cooled it down, which ensures that it's not going to cook or scramble mm -hmm. the eggs that are in this I've recipe. I've done that before. This is one cup of whole milk and two large eggs. So not buttermilk, yet a different cornbread. A lot of cornbreads are made with buttermilk because that tangs mm -hmm. good, unless you're going for something a little on the sweet side. Mm, you're on to me, <laughs> ma'am. All right, and as you can see, I'm just whisking this until combined. And because of the temperature of the butter and temperature of the cold milk, sometimes it does tend to clump, and that's totally okay. Yep. That's just because of the temperature of everything combining. Mm -hmm, those clumps would melt in the oven. Mm -hmm. All right, let's combine everything together here. Here's the dry. Thank you. So here we have the dry ingredients and I'm going to add the wet. Then I'm just going to whisk the wet ingredients into the dry ingredients until just combined. And that's important because you don't want to form any extra gluten at this stage. Extra gluten means extra chewy cornbread. All right, this looks great. Just want to reincorporate it just with my rubber spat here. All right, now time to add the blueberries. Mm, the star of the show. The star of the show. 10 ounces, two cups of these Beautiful blueberries. Those are gorgeous. And just like earlier, I'm gonna fold this just until combined. All right, now I will transfer this batter to the prepared pan. And get every little drop in there. So now just gently using my rubber spatula, I'm just going to ever so lightly try and flatten out the top of my cornbread here. That's a lot of blueberries. I guarantee one blueberry, at least one <laughs> blueberry in every bite. Almost done. Here we have one tablespoon more of sugar. Just gonna dust it on the top before going into the oven. How cakey of you. Uh, I've been called worse. <laughs> and you wanna make sure all the cornbread gets covered. So go slow at this stage if you'd like. So I've sprinkled that lovely sugar on top of the cornbread and I have an oven that is preheated to 375 degrees. I'm gonna bake this until nice and golden brown on the top and a paring knife inserted in the center comes out clean. It'll be about 40 to 45 minutes. Mmm. <laughs> smells good. Oh yeah, I am so excited for this. Thank you. So I just Ooh. want to test for doneness. Again, I'm going to insert this paring knife. I'm looking for no crumbs attached onto the sides of it. <laughs> There's no crumbs, but it's not exactly clean. Looks like you stabbed a berry. <laughs> it does. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to let this cool in the cake pan for 20 minutes. All right. And in the meantime, got a little trick up my sleeve, and it's called honey butter. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I have four tablespoons of unsalted butter that is softened. And here I have two tablespoons of honey. 
And I love using these little spatulas for sticky stuff like this or for things that are just in a little tiny bowl because it helps ensure that everything gets out mm -hmm. nice and cleanly. Quarter teaspoon of salt. And finally, a pinch of some cayenne pepper. Oh, I like that, a little mm -hmm. cayenne, a little honey. <laughs> you know, making a flavored butter, a compound butter, is so easy and it just elevates whatever you're cooking. Just kicks everything up just a little notch. 100% behind you there. And people think you really went the extra mile. <laughs> it's true. Meanwhile, it took two seconds <laughs> to put this together. So as you can see, I've been mashing it with a fork, came together really, really easily. So again, we are going to wait 20 minutes for this to cool in the cake pan. All right. All right, it's been 20 minutes. The next step is to run the paring knife between the cornbread and the cake pan. Loosening it up a bit. All right, and now I'm just gonna put the dish towel here just to hold it. Put my hand right on top of the bread. <laughs> Drum roll. <laughs> there we go. We are in business. Nicely done. Thank you so much. So this is still quite warm. It needs about 20 more minutes to cool. All right, it has been 40 long minutes, Julia. <laughs> it's time to slice into All this. All right, I've been waiting for this. All right, so I'm gonna slice it into eight slices. Using the serrated knife, I'm gonna cut it down the middle from top to bottom and from side to side. Then crossways, this just helps to ensure even sizes. Then, These are nice big pieces of cornbread. Oh yeah. You're not skimping. Mm -mm. No skimping in my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, and then the honey butter. Yes. I think I'm just gonna put a little bit on the top. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going in. All right. Mmm. Mmm-hmm. Not too sweet. It really isn't that sweet. I know I've been giving you a hard time about the cakiness. So I'm not a big fan of sweet cornbread. Mm -hmm. It really is right on the line mm -hmm. between cake and cornbread. It's not dense cornbread, it's not cake, and it's not mushy. It really is baked all the way through, mm -hmm. but light. Nice and tender. Mm -hmm. That melted butter is really coming through. Yeah. And we paid attention to how much we are mixing this, or not mixing this, because we didn't want to develop that gluten, which is going to make this tough. Mm -hmm. And it's a cornbread after all. It's <laughs> not a cake, and it's not a hearty, hearty bread. And the sugar actually brings out the corn flavor a little bit, mm. especially given that we're using supermarket cornmeal. It's hard to get a light texture like that yeah. when you're making a melted butter or a bowl cake mm -hmm. because the tendency is to overmix it and that makes it bready. But this is lovely and light. I also love the little crunchy bits of cornmeal that are all around the pan. Mm -hmm. It's like a little crunchy present with every bite. I love that. Mm -hmm. This is delicious, Ashley. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. To make this amazing blueberry cornbread, start by dusting a nine inch round cake pan with cornmeal. Using a three to two ratio of all purpose flour to cornmeal, along with some whole milk and melted butter, mix the batter together by hand before gently stirring in the fresh blueberries. Dust the top with a little sugar, bake for 45 minutes, and let cool slightly before serving with honey butter. From Cook's Country, a great recipe for blueberry cornbread with honey butter. I'm kind of getting rid of the fork. I'm just going. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Officially takes it out of cake territory. That's what I was thinking. <laughs>